Morning, everyone. So um, I thought we would discuss last week's little exam because it's getting to the point now where I keep thinking to myself, you know, I, I, I appreciate that probably what Rishi Sunak is doing is just doing his best to feather his nest. He doesn't care about the election. He doesn't believe he's going to win the election, really. And he doesn't care. He just wants the election as late as possible so we can make as much money as possible for himself, you know, indirectly, mostly his family. And that's it. And you wonder, so why are Tory MPs doing this? And I, I think it's, you, you keep seeing them. Every time Rishi Sunak does a thing, there is no shortage of reports in the press of Tory MPs, usually unnamed, saying, uh, you know, that they've got their head in their hands. And, and the latest one was last week's AI Summit. Now, I am going to have to start off by saying the general idea of the AI Summit was a good one. And you could argue, in terms of its, you know, what it strictly speaking was supposed to be doing, it was a success because it it did. I mean, he held it, and he, and although the attention was on Elon Musk, who's like, you know, what does he know about anything? The it did bring together, for example, the United States and China. Now, it has been pointed out by people who who report on more serious politics that at the moment there isn't. <sighs> There's a lot of antagonism between the United States and China, of course, over the last few years. And there's a real fear that all it takes is a little slip. And not so much like a physical war. Uh, we don't necessarily mean invading Taiwan or something. But just an economic war, a trade war that actually triggers the next banking crisis. So we could do without that. Um, and, and it's identified that one of the major problems we have is something like that, neither side wants a bank a, a global financial crisis right china doesn't want it the united states certainly doesn't want it it would happen like a lot of things happen by mistake but how does that happen misunderstanding so you need a line of communication a diplomatic line of communication and it's really very poor whereas something like this rishi Sunak actually had representatives of, of the chinese and american governments together who will have talked together at this summit and could have talked about other things as well so that was a good thing but politically in this country, for the Tories, it was a complete disaster. And I'll go through the three major problems with it. If you're a Tory MP looking at it, and you're not really that bothered about the fact that, you know, you've you've brought together, uh, you know, different governments around the world. But in terms of like, how is it any good for the Tories? So the first thing is Liz Truss actually attacked the decision to invite China. She said that they they should not be. Now, yes, you could say she's just a loony on the back benches now, but she still has a lot of support within the party. Remember, her fringe speech at the Conservative Party conference was better attended than a lot of cabinet ministers' speeches at the conference. So Liz Truss still has a lot of support within the party, and even within the parliamentary party, distressingly. You know, there's lots of MPs trying to urge Sunak and Hunt to basically do Liz Truss Mark II for some reason. So that hasn't been helpful. Secondly, the summit basically highlighted that the UK has no role in the future of AI regulation. Like Rishi Sunak's doing this thing. I think I've got on my, I'm not sure how easily you can see it, um, but the um, the thing I've got behind me is Rishi Sunak delivering his speech. And what that says in full, AI Safety Summit, Hosted by the UK, 1st to 2nd of November 2023. Now, why would you have that there, hosted by the UK under it? Because Rishi Sunak's trying to present this global Britain thing. Like, if that wasn't there, if it was just AI safety summit, we know it's hosted in the UK. But if that's all it was, in most summits, you'll just see like that, won't you? Um, you know, the fact that he's put in hosted by the UK is, is an indication that what he wants is for people to look at it and go, you know, this is global Britain. You know, this is what we promised with Brexit. Global Britain leading the world. Only we're not. Because um, Kamala Harris, who was there, who's obviously the uh, American vice president. Before she headed off to the summit, she, um, made a, she made a statement. She made a little speech in America saying that America will be shaping the rules for AI. But it's, she basically said just before she went to this summit, that we weren't going to have international 
agreements on rules governing AI that America was going to take the lead on that. So effectively, she was saying, yeah, the UK, yeah, we're not interested in your ideas. We'll come along to your meetings, but we're not interested in your ideas. So basically embarrassing for the concept of global Britain. And then the third thing, which had Tory MPs absolutely tearing their hair out. So imagine, right, you're, you're a year before the election. So they, they're, they're planning, maybe, we think, uh, for an election on October the 31st next year, which I think's mad. I think they should do it in summer. But anyway, so they're thinking that. So then imagine what you need to do before an election is get people optimistic about the future, don't you? You've been in power for 14 years. In fact, by next October, it's like nearer 14 and a half years. You've been in power for 14 and a half years. Labour are comfortable with people being pessimistic about the future because that, that's triggering a change. The Conservatives need you to be optimistic, to feel that the people who've been in charge for 14 and a half years should remain in charge. So you need to be a bit optimistic about That's how Boris Johnson won it in 2019, effectively. A bit of optimism there. Uh, surrounded by Brexit, but never mind. So the last thing you would want to do is to platform someone who's going, who's telling everyone in Britain, oh, yeah, your jobs, yeah, AI is going to take those in a few years. There were Tory MPs going, are you mental? Because that's what Rishi Sunak did. He had this big thing with Elon Musk at the end. And, and Elon Musk was, apart from contradicting Rishi Sunak in a few areas, which is also embarrassing, he basically said, oh, yeah, AI is going to take everyone's jobs in a few years. Great, thanks. Tory MPs were looking at it going, thanks, thanks, Rishi, mate. Thanks for that. Great one. Uh, Maggie Pie, um, 20 uh, something dollars. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, seeing Sunak's campaign page for his own seat, CBAV. Um, no, <laughs> I haven't. Um, but I, 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 you know, I, I, like, I am in two minds as to whether Rishi Sunak thinks he can win or not, because he's that conceited. Maybe he thinks something will turn around. But it, it, you look at the polls and it's an absolute disaster area, everything about it. And it's not like, because people say, oh, you know, over the next year, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. It's like, the, Sunak keeps putting all his hopes on this inflation thing. Oh, inflation will be down to about 3% then. It's like, yeah, and the cost of living will still be worse. Because, you know, people think, People think that we've got, um, you know, that, that there's too many people think that when inflation gets lower, prices get lower. It's like, no, they no, they still go up. <laughs> the prices still go up. Inflation doesn't stop the prices going up. Unless it's negative inflation. And the only negative inflation that's possible is on energy prices. Oh, Robert Loris, thank you very much. £20 super chat. Um, anyway, go through for comments before I go into the next bit. Um, Oh, Captain Bart Roberts coming up with an American comment here. Tomorrow in court, Ivanka goes on the stand. Yesterday went badly for, uh, is that what you're calling the orange one now? Drump, drump filth skin. Uh, company is circling the drain. Yes, let's just hope they don't pull a tricky dicky and pardon him. Um, well, <laughs> the only people that can pardon, well, he can't actually. Uh, no, there's, there's no pardon possible in this case. So um, obviously we need to be worried about what happens with the elections because until... Until a legal situation says, and I don't know enough about American law or, or politics, until legally he can't stand as president, then it's always a worry. Uh, anyway, uh, isn't the Minister of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs um, the one that decides to ban the XM bull is not Sweller Bravman? Um, I'm not actually sure about that. No, I don't think so. I think the Home Office... I think that can be the homeless. I'm trying to remember because there was, an, there was a similar situation 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. Actually, was it about 30 years ago? In John Major's time, the Dangerous Dogs Act. So it's quite bizarre. That was actually, no, it must have been over 30 years ago because that was before they won in 1992. I think this might be 91, 92. Yeah, they were going on about pit bulls, I think, was it? Something like that. Some breed of dogs. Um, and it was like, so the Dangerous Dogs Act was going to come in. I don't think very much happened with it in the end. I think they ended up just saying, oh, you'll have to register the dogs. 
you'll have to register. So you, you, you register them. So you've got them. Um, so this may be the same thing, but I'm trying to remember. I, I have an idea that was the home office at the time, but I can't remember for certain. It's not, if I'm honest, one of the things I've... Um, oh, Swedish Krona, thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm just used to dollars, pounds and euros. <laughs> But there we go. Uh, not a few years at all. It's nowhere near advanced enough. It, it really makes no difference, Vendetta. The point is that Rishi Sunak stood on a platform with someone who said your jobs have been taken by AI just before an election. You know, because, again, it, it just highlights Rishi Sunak's complete political naivety. There are, there are certain political basics that you would think any MP should know Although my experience of observing MPs is there's lots of MPs who just don't seem to have... Because it, it's if I was to say, there's a lot of things I've learned observing politics. But if I was to highlight one thing that for me is very... When I think of myself as like a teenager interested in politics, but not necessarily that knowledgeable. And now, if I was to suggest one massive difference, it is that I used to think that MPs at least understood some of the basics of politics like they 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 must have sort of plied their trade on the campaign trail becoming councillors or whatever and that they knew about politics and what i've seen over the last few decades not just in recent years but in recent years it's got particularly bad is actually there's quite a lot of mps who've been selected by because you think about it you know you've got a local party like Surely there's quite a few of them would like to be an MP. So you sort of imagined that they would pick the best amongst them. You know, they'd pick the best amongst them to be their candidate. And it's quite clear this does not occur at all. Um, so that's what I would say. I, I just now say that, you know, MP, but you still expected until a few years ago that the ones who rise to the top in politics will be good politicians because but it's like, no, Sonak's such an idiot. It's really basic. If you are the party in opposition, you have to make people believe that everything is so bad that, you know, things can only get better because that's what triggers a change of government. You have to believe because the problem is when you've been out of power for so long, like the public car, in all honesty, say, oh, yeah, I'm totally confident that Rishi Sunak is, um, is uh, sorry, uh, Keir Starmer and his government will be really competent and they're going to do all these amazing things. They can't possibly say that. They're untested, right? So they have to believe that the Tories are so bad that actually anything will be better than that. I'll just go over the Super Chats before I carry on with that thought. Uh, John Ball, 499, says, should Labour reverse the Tory restrictions on our rights to vote, strike and protest? Um, yes. Uh, I I'm going to say wholeheartedly yes on that. How they do it is another matter. When I will just qualify it by saying when people keep saying, well, they should just repeal all these laws. Remember that repealing laws takes a lot of parliamentary time and Labour need that parliamentary time to Im implement reforms. And sometimes you can just do it by changing guidance. So and they have said that they have said that they will change. They will change guidance in the first instance. Then it might be amending. Then, you know, so they'll work through it. Uh, and then Steve Kirk, £10 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, so we've now got a situation where you've got people at the top of politics who are completely naive because it, it's really this simple. If you're in opposition, you want people to be pessimistic. If you're in government, you want them to be optimistic because a population that's optimistic will will stick. Even if it thinks that you're not doing a brilliant job, as long as you fear, the op as long as the public fear the opposition more, then the government stays in. Um, and that's really all there is to it. This it was a complete nonsense to to platform someone. And the thing is, it's not even like even though Rishi Sunak may not have known he was going to say that, he sh he would have known he was going to say something stupid because Elon Musk is a very stupid man, really. He, he like you know people think he's really I mean second richest man in the world and all this and yeah he is, and he, he spotted an opportunity, fair enough, and he might be decent enough at business. He might be a decent businessman. Fine. But 
I mean, when you look at like, what do people think he's clever for? Oh, Tesla, it's marvellous, isn't it? It's like, no, it, it was ahead of the curve. He identified the opportunity early, but it's not. The Tesla cars are not actually very good compared to their competitors. And look what he's done to Twitter. The, the idea that this man is an expert on tech, you know, should now be dispelled. I understand why he'd be invited to an AI summit because he owns a major social media platform, right? So, of course, you invite him. Um, but you don't, like, share a platform with him because you know he's a loose cannon. You know, it's, it's like social media's answer to Sweller Braverman. But anyway. Um, why does anyone think there's any skill involved? Simply a popularity contest for ugly people, isn't it? It is a popularity contest, but you also know how, you need to know how to play the game. And, and I've said this before. I think part of the problem, the reason why we have these really very poor quality politicians at the top of the tree now is because the Conservatives had it so easy. And that brings us back to why Tory MPs aren't doing anything about... Like, every time Sunak does a thing now, you will find... And I don't just mean the Tory rebels, right? It's understood they're going to attack him at every turn, just like Labour rebels attack Starmer at every turn. That's a given, right? It's, it's the fact... Although you'll notice that the Labour rebels, you know, Gaza notwithstanding, the Labour rebels are being much more muted in their opposition to Starmer than they were two years ago. Why is that? Because he's winning. Um, but this is, we're not talking about the, the Tory rebels. We're talking about ordinary Tory MPs, backbench MPs. Every time he does a thing, they're just going, why has he done that? Why has he done that? And, and I think there's two problems that they've got. First of all, they're trapped. They can't get rid of him. They, they can't get rid of him. I saw a comment, I think, early on saying, you know, about get that. I don't think the letters will go in. Uh, there's some letters gone in inevitably. That's the rebels, right? I don't think it's going to end up with a confidence vote. Because why? Why would you do that? That'll just make it worse. Like, you, you can't. I, 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 they're stuck with him. They're absolutely stuck. But that doesn't mean to say they couldn't force him to change tack. But they're not doing. They haven't done. In fact, you know, the King's speech today, the King's speech has been written now. It's done. He's now going to. He's now, you know, whatever is announced today, we know what's going to be announced today, is now going to be Tory policy for the and set out their strategy for the election. It's a disaster. Um, but I think the other problem is that Tory MPs themselves, they're, because they had a, such an easy time winning their seats, because Labour have not until recently presented any sort of, um, uh, like, opposition, really, to them. So they've had it easy. They've had it easy since 2010. And because like three quarters of Tory MPs right now were voted in from 2010 onwards, most of them have no had no real contest for their seats. Like there's the odd one might have had to fight a difficult marginal. Most of them had it easy, had it easy. And so they don't know what to do because they themselves have never had to battle politically so now that they're in a major political battle where they're in very much a losing position, they really don't know how to react. Uh, Maggie Pye, back again with 50 Swedish kroner this time, get it right. Uh, Boris Johnson not knowing what the uh, single market is should be as shocking as Sir Lewis Hamilton not knowing the difference between clutch and the brake. I think he used an automatic clutch, doesn't he, in a Formula One car? Uh, but yeah, well, it should have been. I mean, you know, you don't expect a politician to be an expert in something as complex as a single market. But you should at least know what it is and what it's for and what the consequence of leaving it would be. That should be known. I absolutely agree. Uh, that should be known. And, and you know, the idea that, that um, Dominic Cummings was able to boast that he kept Boris Johnson in the dark about it to get his Brexit through is... Um, is absolutely mind-boggling. They say Musk highly intelligent but completely lacking in emotional intelligence. I think there's a lot of intelligence is missing in though. You know, because again, why is his company like he stole a march on everyone else, right? Really? Why hasn't he maintained, you know, his his dominance in the field? He's trading on his name is what he's doing. 
Um, Musk doesn't come across as intelligent to me. Lucky, vicious, and racist, more like. I mean, he, there, there will be aspects of him. As I say, you know, even he had to have made some good business decisions. He, he is the second richest man in the world. And, you know, he didn't inherit all that. Uh, it wasn't like Trump, where he inherited a load of money and made it a much smaller amount of money and then just had to inflate his wealth, uh, which is what's partly causing a lot of his legal problems. Um, you know, he must have, must, must have had some business intelligence at the very least. But he's not a tech expert. I mean, we sort of, if, if it wasn't obvious before, it became obvious um, during, you know, his takeover of Twitter when engineers had to explain incredibly basic things to him, which obviously did not go in because, that, I mean, even if we suppose that he is deliberately trying to dismantle Twitter, it's, um, it... You know, the, the fact that he just doesn't understand basic things about it, it means that you, you can not regard him as a tech genius. Like, as I say, if I was Sunak and I were organising this summit, and I don't blame him for organising the summit, the summit was a good idea in itself. I just think, I mean, I said in a video when I did it on, a, another problem he had is if you look at the optics of this from the public's point of view. So he's having, he had this summit last week. So it's like, okay, were there any crises going on? Yeah, we've got a cost of living crisis on this in this country, right? And then we had 200 Britons in Gaza trapped. Now, there's still like 100 there, I think. I think we've now got 100 out. But at the time he was holding this summit, when he was going, look at me, look at me, it was like, mate, we've got a cost of living crisis in here. You're doing nothing about that. We've got 200 British citizens trapped in Gaza. What are you doing about that? So the fact he was putting emphasis on this, and the thing is, what he should have done was to get the public to, to agree that this summit's a good idea. It was a good idea in many ways. The way he did it wasn't necessarily, but the, the summit itself was good. And there were agreements that came from it. It's just that one of those agreements was that the UK has nothing to contribute to this other than tea and biscuits. But he didn't get the public. The public don't see the benefit of this summit. So he's doing that. He's taking part in this summit taking time away from what they think is time he should be spending on helping British citizens abroad and dealing with the cost of living crisis here. And it was all really, you know, politically, it was just a mess. It was a political mess for the Tories. Uh, you know, and I, I just really think now that Tory, there were Tory MPs, the way I look at it, there were Tory MPs who thought that Rishi Sunak was genuinely the answer to their problems. And now the scene that he wasn't, they may still agree, I would still agree, that he was still a better bet than Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. Definitely. Boris Johnson was a non-starter because, remember, you know, the privilege... People keep forgetting about the Privileges Committee. So Boris Johnson couldn't be kept in place. Liz Truss obviously couldn't be kept in place. So they had... And there was no one better. So even in hindsight, it's like, in hindsight, what should Tory MPs have done? What? Like, would Penny, Penny Moore not have been better? No, she would not. So they still stuck with Sunak. But, and that's why they're trapped there. So sorry, Phil, the government of Qatar got the people out. Um, yes, but we still had to coordinate with it, didn't we? We still, would have, we still expected Rishi Sunak to be coordinating that as an emergency, wouldn't you? If, if you've got 200 of your citizens suddenly trapped in a war zone, Shouldn't the Prime Minister be chairing emergency COBRA meetings and making sure that, you know, he, he's up to speed with our response on it? Obviously, we know we can't go in. We can't send in paratroopers to extricate them. We know that it's actually going to be uh, governments in the area that are going to secure their release. But we need to be uh, we need to be talking to them to try and do that. There's still 100, as, a, as far as I'm aware, still trapped there. Uh, it's bugger all to suggest online influencers intelligence have any business in the same sense as well and, and anyone indeed i mean everyone has to be judged on their own merits really and no, they're right as i say there are different types of intelligence you know it's, it's something you get in science called the curse of expertise where sometimes when you are an ex you've proven expert in one area people sort of think you're also an expert in a what seems a related area but isn't 
And you have it all the time. You know, you had, I always point out Albert Einstein. He was obviously a genius. There's no point in denying it, but he was also an idiot because he kept pronouncing on things over which he had no expertise. Because he was, you know, Professor Cleverclogs in the early 20th century, everyone thought he was the, you know, because he was a very clever physicist. They thought, oh, he knows everything about physics. No, he knows a lot about like two bits of physics. That's it. He knew a lot about two bits of physics. But then he thought he, he felt he should have an answer about any question that was asked of him. Uh, and where was Cleverly off on a jolly with the king? Well, I mean, Cleverly's arguably doing more work than Sunak here. Um, uh, James, you keep pushing it, but you're going to have to you're going to have to sort of join us in, in the real world if you want to actually contribute. Uh, I like how I have these streams talking about these serious issues and then you get these really obnoxious adverts that have nothing to do with the stream. Well, that, that, I'm afraid the, the uh, adverts are what YouTube think you want to watch. Uh, that is the thing with the adverts. There was a little period where people on my channel, and I think it's happened to others as well, were getting um, adverts from Nigel Farage popping up on it for a time. Uh, I don't know whether that's because he stopped putting adverts on YouTube or whether because the content's less relevant now, but it's all really weird. Uh, well, Angry Pagan, five pound super chat. Thank you very much. Says, do Labour have a counter narrative with AI uh, and business? Really wish Labour would push more counter narratives instead of just letting the Tories uh, f up. Um, I'm not really sure. Like, I think Labour's attitude to AI is more positive. Um, really, um, I, I mean, it's one of those things. It's like AI is like anything, isn't it? It can be it can be a tool for good and it can be a tool for like really terrible evil. But Labour don't have a, a set position on it. But then the other thing is, even if they did, they wouldn't necessarily announce it because, like I've just said, the public don't think it's a big issue. You know, they, that's why this this summit was politically a bad idea, even if it had gone better for Sunak, because the public aren't taken with it. You know, and all the public have got out of that is, oh, AI is going to take our jobs now. Um, <laughs> which actually, I don't know. There's part of me thinks, uh, do I mind that? Because, you know, some people, particularly older people than me, will say, um, you know, oh, you remember tomorrow's world. And, and they, they, they promise that all these robots servants would let us put our feet up all the time and we'd have to do nothing all the work would be done for us by robots and we could put our feet up and it's like you through all these things no one ever asked so how are you going to get paid then if you're not being productive how are you going to buy these robots so the way i look at it is when we talk about the cost of living crisis over the last two years there's people like the bottom 20 percent thinking what do you mean the last two years? We're on a cost of living crisis for 15 bloody years. And there'll be some people for longer than that. Some people don't know when there wasn't a cost of living crisis. So you think to yourself, these people are the ones who are always screwed, particularly by conservative governments. But there's always some people that, you know, have money worries, even in a Labour government. And you think, so what's the answer to this? Well, it's some form of universal basic income, right? And, and if we had universal basic income, then it wouldn't be a huge deal if technology was. Oh, I'll tell you one policy that Labour do have. It's just, I've just re remembered it. So and actually, I think this is a proposal rather than a set policy. It's a proposal. It's not firm policy. But Labour have suggested an AI tax. So in other words, if a company gets rid of jobs um, using AI, that they pay a tax for that. Now, exactly, and this is a proposal, exactly how that equates into then, um, you know, helping the workers who no longer have the jobs, I don't know. Maybe that will feed into universal basic income. Who knows? But anyway, the point is that if we had a situation, the reason why the cost of living crisis is now considered a crisis is because it's affecting way more than the bottom 
You know, it's affecting the middle classes, the voting classes, right? So, and therefore, you know, Labour are certainly going to have to do something about it. The Tories are going to lose because of it. Labour are going to have to do something about it if they want to carry on winning. So then you think, so what if we had a situation where the cost of living crisis was really more permanent because AI was taking, technology was taking so many jobs? You know, we're already used to the idea that a lot, you know, a lot of mechanical jobs are taken because robots can do a lot of things now. Whereas now the idea, but then we've developed into this service industry uh, where a lot of things, oh yeah, well, a robot can't do my job. It's like, well, you know, but AI can. So even middle, you know, think about a middle manager. We don't actually, you know, AI could easily do the job of a middle manager, probably do it better. Because what's a middle manager need to do? It needs to deal with a few issues. It needs to deal with like holidays, stuff like that. AI can do most of that. And the stuff it can't do can go up to a more senior manager. So you can, you know, management positions can be dealt with by AI. So there's so much that you can just get rid of. And you think, as this happens and more and more people struggle, doesn't it, doesn't it increase the calls for UBI? And the thing is, I see UBI as the only way to, to really stop there being a bottom 20% that is constantly facing financial nightmare situations. And I don't see UBI ever really becoming a political imperative until the majority of swing voters see the need for it. So I sometimes wonder, I don't know, I'm not saying this is definitely my position, but I sometimes wonder if maybe letting AI not run riots because we have to make sure like deep fakes and things like that are clamped or we can't have it used for deceptive purposes. But in terms of like getting rid of jobs, if it did it in a more accelerated manner, it would accelerate the calls for UBI. That's how I look at it. It would also necessitate to pay for all this that we properly tax companies, properly tax them. But that is just me thinking off the top of my head, and I'm not an economist. Uh, Martin Jones, five pound super chat. Thank you very much there. Um, Add up the labor required to maintain the machine and divide it up. So we do a four year stint in some part of the machine, guessing four years based on no evidence, call it a national labor. But yeah, well, there are things like that you could certainly do. I mean, the thing is, the Tories at the moment are pushing back against four day working weeks. There's a lot of councils carrying out four day working week trials, and they're quite successful. They always are successful. And the, the Tories, I think, will wait to see what's in the King's speech, but I gather one of the things is going to be banning it. That's what I've been told, that the Tories are going to ban councils from implementing four-day working weeks. And you ask yourself, why? Why would they do that? Because they represent the people who rent out the office space and sell the sandwiches and the coffees, basically. Uh, so if people are only going to work four days in the week, you don't need as much office space. And, um, you know, your sandwich shops don't sell as many sandwiches. Uh, but there we go. Uh, UBI is uh, landlords hiking rents as people have a regular amount of income. Yeah, yeah, you can't just like UBI. See, that's the thing. People think UBI just means, I have to make this the last point because we're going over, I'm afraid. You know, people think UBI just means giving everyone a set amount of money and then that's it. No, that can't, that doesn't work. That can't possibly work. You know, it has, it has to include a, a, a whole scale reform about essential cost of living as well. Because, yeah, if you just gave everyone a, a, an amount of money, then all you'd do is drive up inflation if you just did that. We know that can't work, which is why when you call for UBI, I'm always a bit hesitant because it's like, well, what does that mean? What's your plan for it? Because I've not actually seen a workable plan for it. Because usually when people carry out trials of it, that's all it does. Because they're just a trial, all they do is give some people a certain amount of money and see what happens. Well, nothing, because you need to make sure you can control the prices as well. Or you apply windfall profits, right? So if you're making extra money, we'll just take it all in tax and then redistribute it. But it'll just be easier to control the prices, I suspect. But there we are. We're going to have to sort of... Uh, We'll call it there. We've sort of gone on a round trip there. We've gone well over time. Uh, don't forget, yes, to to click the like button. And uh, yeah, any minute now, Phil's going to notice the time. He has noticed the time. Uh, and to subscribe to the channel as well. 
Uh, thanks very much for coming on. Have a very good day. And until next time, I'll see you later.